Welcome. Welcome to another um, in our series of information ecology lectures. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming, and I'd like to thank in particular um, Jennifer Jenkins, who is the person who actually uh, arranges all of this and makes it all happen. So a small round of applause for Jennifer, I think. Jennifer is the director of our Center for the Study of the Public Domain. I invite you to go to our webpage and have a look at the other things that we're um, doing. But today, we have, um, we're have we extremely lucky and honored to have uh, Professor uh, Bernd Hugenholtz, who is a professor of intellectual property law at the University of Amsterdam and also the director of the, um, information, the Institute for Information Law uh, at the same institution. Um, you might want to have a look at their website uh, also. Knowing the uh, linguistic inadequacies of their American and British uh, colleagues, they're even nice enough to have a substantial number of them in English. So uh, if you look there, you'll find some really some very interesting studies. Um, we're delighted to have Bernd here. Um, he's uh, one of our favorite colleagues. He's someone who brings this uh, a rich knowledge of uh, the comparative uh, aspect of intellectual property law. He understands, deeply understands because of his work uh, as a professor, as an advisor to the Minister of Justice in Netherlands, as someone who's consulted for WIPO, understands both uh, the American and the European traditions in intellectual property law. Um, he's also someone who's written um, on uh, a wide range of subjects from, from databases to uh, freedom of uh, expression and intellectual property law. And we're actually going to put up on our website a link to a fabulous paper he has on the potential tensions, conflicts, and reinforcements between um, copyright law and free expression in Europe under, um, uh, in particular, with the European Convention of Human Rights. And that's a fascinating analysis. Those of you who are interested in the tensions between copyright and free speech uh, in the American context really might like to have a look at that for comparative purposes. But his subject today is a different one. Um, Bernd, who is also, uh, among his many other distinctions, the legal project lead for um, Creative Commons uh, uh, Netherlands, is going to talk to us about uh, the differences and similarities between two extremes, the droit d'auteur tradition of Europe, uh, Europe's uh, 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 copyright uh, regime, and the Creative Commons scheme, which he'll tell you a little bit more about. Bernd Hugenholz, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Boyle, uh, for this uh, very kind introduction. Thanks, Jennifer, for uh, making all this uh, possible. Um, I'll do lo a lot more thanking in the next few days. I'm, I'm already delighted uh, with this, uh, my first visit to Duke, and I'm impressed. Um, let's see if this is mutual. You've already seen my face. Here are my words. The uh, public domain starts here with the author, the creator of works of literature, science, and art. Absent authorship, no creation, no culture, no creative commons. But creation, of course, is not enough. What we need is the author's willingness to dedicate his work after he's made it, after he's created, to the public domain, to make it available for everyone out there, for you, for me, for free. So we need an author and a creation and a license. But what if the author does not own the rights in the works that he produces? What if he has given his rights away to some big bad media company out there, let's call it Kluwer or Elsevier or Time Warner, they're everywhere, these bad guys. What if he has signed away all his rights to one of those companies and the company is unwilling to grant Creative Commons licenses, which is highly likely? So we need more to make this system, this system of Creative Commons work. We need an author, we need a creation, we need a license, but we also need the author controlling his own rights. We need an author's right. We need a droit d'auteur. This is, in a nutshell, what this story is about. Conceived from radically different visions of copyright, American-bred creative commons, and old Europe-style droit d'auteur, author's rights, as we say, 
um, have more in common than initially meets the eye. And combining both ideas might even inspire us to come up with a model for the future regulation of copyright that bridges the great Atlantic divide between the author's rights tradition of civil law Europe and the American tradition of copyright. You may wonder, what is Creative Commons? I understand Professor Boyle already conducted a brief poll. Most of you know this, some of you don't. Here's a brief primer. You actually have one of the founders of Creative Commons in your midst, Professor Boyle. He's on the board and he's one of the initiators. And you may also know, may know or at least uh, have heard of, its main initiator and main promoter, Professor Lawrence Lessig. I can say Larry. Larry Lessig, one of the great gurus of the internet, the rock star of cyber law. You may have even communicated with him over his blog. Um, Creative Commons provides a general purpose open content licensing model that was obviously inspired by the open source movement, but takes the open source or the free software movement a step further by applying it to the realm of culture, not of software, but of culture in general, books, music, video, visual arts, photos, what have you. And Creative Commons thereby supports that by offering a platform of predefined standard form online licenses, allowing authors and artists to grant users broad user freedoms, while at the same time reserving certain rights that these authors, authors want to keep for themselves. So Creative Commons is quite a elegant private ordering mechanism that really works, based in copyright and contract law. And it is more, it is also an incubator of emerging legal norms, as we shall see. Here's a bit more on Creative Commons, taken from the Creative Commons site. The nice thing about this site is you can just plunder it for your presentations. It's all available for free. Anyway, these are nice comics. Every Creative Commons license allows the world to distribute, display, copy, and webcast your work, provided they abide by certain conditions of your choice. You may choose. You may cho choose how many rights you want to give away. And these are a couple of the uh, most popular Creative Commons licenses available out there. Many of you probably already have tried them. If not, do it. Just license your holiday pictures, holiday snapshots under a Creative Commons license. Nobody will be interested, but it's fun to do it. Um, as you can see, there's a, a, a variety, a permutation of license forms that is, uh, that typifies the Creative Commons license. And they are all illustrated or symbolized by these nice little icons. The buy icon means attribution. The dollar with a cross through it means no commercial use. The equal sign means do not change my work, no derivative works. And the circular arrow means if you use my work, please offer it under similar terms, share it alike. You can combine these and mix these uh, license forms into six different general license types. That's the way it works. And here's uh, one example of what you get if you choose a certain license. In this case, the attribution, non-commercial, uh, no derivative license allowing others to use your work as long as they mention your name, as long as they do not use it commercially, as long as they do not make derivative works. That, in, in brief, is how Creative Commons works. It's been a phenomenally successful uh, project, launched only uh, three years ago, in December 2002. Um, Yahoo 
the Yahoo search engine now already reports more than 50 million link backs to CC licenses. That is amazing. And that's not only in the United States, that is all over the world, as we shall see. At first blush, equating Creative Commons cool technocratic hip creative commons to old-fashioned romantic boring 19th century author's rights seems a bit far-fetched I admit that these are legal regimes centuries apart worlds or should I say continents apart creative commons obviously espouses the utilitarian the instrumentalist vision American style copyright law that underlies your US Copyright Act that is even based in a constitutional clause to promote the progress of science and useful art promote the widest possible dissemination of works by using this by applying this exclusive rights for limited term minimal rights broad user freedoms those are the typical traits of the US system as it was originally emphasized and as it is now being reinvented by Creative Commons. Creative Commons also, in a way, reinstates the formality requirement that was a typical element of the US system. It's actually still there, the copyright notice, the registration, but it's no longer really required since uh, the United States, as you probably all know, acceded to the Bern Convention in 1989, the, the great international convention on copyright law. Since then, those formalities are no longer allowed. But Creative Commons in bas basically reinstates them. The CC wasn't invented for nothing. It is a symbolic play, a symbol play on the C in the circle of the uh, old days of copyright. Some rights reserved instead of all rights reserved, formalities. And then the CC, the Creative Commons system, even provides for an as one of many options not mentioned, for the possibility of offering your work under a shorter, under a decreased term of protection, not the current protection of life plus 70, that is now the law in the United States, but under a founder's copyright license, which basically emulates the old, the ancient 40 to 28 years of protection provided by the very first US Copyright Act in 1790. In fact, Creative Commons wants to reduce copyright to its original Jeffersonian proportions. In a very interesting article by Professor Elkin Corrin, not yet published, she labels Creative Commons as, in essence, a reactionary movement. This is back to the roots of US copyright. Now contrast that with author's rights. Author's rights, the predominant paradigm in large parts of the world, but not here in the United States. In civil law countries, in particular, author's rights is the name of the game, not copyright. In France, in Germany, in Italy, Spain, in all of Latin America, in Mexico, many countries really close to the United States have embraced author's rights, not copyright. Author's rights are rooted not in ideas of utilitarianism, instrumentalism, not by the idea that it's good to give authors a limited monopoly so that they wake up and create and then get rewarded. No. Authors' rights are rooted in notions of natural justice. Authors' rights, as the quote goes, are not created by law but always existed somewhere in the legal consciousness of man. In our inherent ideas of natural justice. I quote Professor Boyle again. Intellectual property in the vision of the author's rights model is merely the token awarded to the author by a grateful society. That's a very different point of departure. And the focus is on the author, and particularly on his moral rights that cannot be alienated. We will 
look into those in a few minutes. And in the author's rights, natural justice model rights should be as strong as possible, exceptions as narrowly carved out as possible. And there are no formalities because the right is created upon creation. The right is a natural right, no need to fill in forms. The Berne Convention, already mentioned, under, underlies and underscores this point, was built on the idea of author's rights and therefore prohibits such formalities. And then, maybe adding to the impopularity of the author's rights model here in the United States, and elsewhere, long terms of protection. I know French scholars who advocate perpetual copyright. Well, it's not as bad as that, but in the European Union, we've been enjoying, or at least we've been having very long terms for a very long time. Germany has had life plus 70 since the 60s, and that has become the EU-wide norm thanks to a process of harmonization a norm that was later on exported to the United States. If you ever wonder why you have this long term, thank us. I apologize. It's not just Disney, it's the European Union. And then look at a few other, it could have been worse, look at a few other authors' rights countries. The Ivory Coast, the whole of Africa, most of it is also authors' rights domain. Life plus 99. Maybe that's because they live a bit shorter there. Could be. Mexico recently enacted a revision, life plus 100. And as far as I can uh, determine, they are the, the world record holders in terms of protection right now. So, very long term. So, the distance between Creative Commons, a reactionary, pure form of original US copyright, an author's right on the other side could hardly be greater at first sight. The gap being even wider than the gap we already perceive as problematic between current US copyright and author's right. So how then can we explain the formidable success of Creative Commons worldwide? Creative Commons has been picked up with incredible enthusiasm in recent years all over Europe, mostly in droit d'auteur countries, in countries that embrace the author's rights regime. In the Netherlands, where I come from, Creative Commons was launched in June last year, with Larry Lessig, of course, as our main attraction. In a recent policy document of the Dutch Ministry of Justice, Creative Commons was expressly mentioned as a means of promoting cultural production and dissemination. Creative Commons launch parties are happening almost every week all over the European Union. Coming Saturday, for instance, in Slovenia, in Ljubljana, Slovenia, and you are all invited. I will be there. Larry Lessig will be there too, of course. So why is that? How is it possible that we are all falling for this pure American system? Are we all succumbing to US hegemony in the copyright field? Or could it perhaps be that Creative Commons does ring a familiar bell? Let's have a somewhat closer look at the author's right system main attraction of the system, to me at least, to authors at least, is that it provides protection not only against unauthorized third-party users, the so-called pirates in modern parlance, you, students, file sharers, but also, and even primarily, against legitimate users, the media companies that use the work on a basis of a transfer. The author's right regime reinforces author's position in their contractual relationships, and that's very different. 
from the copyright regime. Moral rights are the main example here, but I'll give you another one in a few minutes. Moral rights, you probably have heard of them and then immediately discarded them as something you got to forget for your examination because they do not exist in the United States. This is true, maybe at least the latter part. They do not exist. They should exist, but they do not exist. But we do have them in Europe, and that means in a broad sense. What are they? In, they are inalienable rights of creators, of the true creator, not of their employers or the, those that contract the work. No, the actual creators have the rights, and they're enforceable against third and second parties, against those big bad publishers, for instance. They are waivable only to a very limited extent, and you can find them in the Berne Convention, Article 6b, to which the United States had heard in 1989. There are many moral rights, some of them found in Article 6b, some not there. I will mention only those that are found in the Berne Convention and that are considered to be the two main ones. A right of paternity, also known as a right of attribution, or for the real purist, droit de paternité. We love French in author's rights country. The author has a right to claim the authorship of the work, to be named as the author. That's an important right. That is your claim to fame. And the second one, the right of integrity, or the droit au respect in French. A right of the author to object to the abridgment, to the distortion, to any mutilation of his work that might harm his reputation. You might wonder, why does he need a moral right? Doesn't he have a derivative work right? To base that on? No, not if he has sold his rights. He always retains this moral right. So it's really important. Now compare that set of moral rights to Creative Commons. And what do we see? We see basic rights in that catalog of standard licenses. Basic rights that mirror that idea of moral rights to a large extent. We see a right of attribution which is part of all the main licenses available on the system. That's the buy icon. Always mention the author. And we see an optional no derivative works license, which reminds me to a large extent of the right of integrity, the moral right I just mentioned. These are in fact moral rights or something very close to them. And interestingly, such moral rights do not exist in US copyright law, or at least not in the US Copyright Act. Now, of course, all American copyright scholars will want to take the floor and say, but they do exist in case law based on the Lanham Act and based on such and such provision. That's all nonsense. They're not there. They're only there in a very small part of the US Copyright Act, which was enacted after the accession of the United States to Bern. Section 106A of the US Copyright Act, the Visual Artist Rights Act, does recognize them for visual artists, but not for writers, not for filmmakers, not for most other creators. They're not there. But they're in Creative Commons. Interesting. Let's go back to the author's rights for a minute. There's another author protective layer of rights there, which is possibly even more powerful than the moral right. Statutory limits on the possibility of granting rights to second parties, to publishers, to those big bad media I mentioned before. Several countries do it in different ways, but there's some limits to transfer, some limits to grants all over the place in every author's rights regime I know. Germany goes the furthest. Germany, the Valhalla of author's rights, does not even allow a full assignment 
you cannot assign your entire copyright in Germany. Interesting. The big media companies there, Bertelsmann, you cannot give them your right. At least not in, by way of full assignment. What you can do is license, but that's another story. This no full assignment rule reflects the power of the moral right in Germany. The moral right is considered so powerful that it, ev it, it, it overshadows the economic right and they cannot be divided. The monistic concept of copyright, we call it. Forget that. More rules to protect authors against giving their rights away. A purpose of grant rule, which you find in Germany, the Netherlands, Spain, and a few other countries, meaning that if the terms of a contract are unclear, the grant is limited to only such uses that are necessary to fulfill the purpose of the grant. That means if, you, if your contract with your publisher tells you you have given all your rights away, you've actually only given your publishing rights away and you hang on to your film rights, your electronic rights, etc. That's a really good rule. And a somewhat similar rule exists in France and Belgium, where transfers are only valid insofar that the scope of the rights, the territory, and the uses are really specified. And if you don't specify, you don't transfer. And then there's more author protection in Germany, Belgium, and Spain, where you cannot even transfer unknown or new uses very normal thing in the United States. And again, in a couple of countries, there's a reversion rule. You get your rights back if the media company does not use your rights. And last not least, work made for hire does not exist in the pure author's rights regime. So lots of author protection, not against pirates, but against big media. And interestingly, in a very recent revision of the German Copyright Act, all this was rediscussed, reinforced, and even broadened. So this is not something of the past in Europe. So this kind of clause is not valid in Europe, to say the least. No all rights contracts in Europe. And they are wrong indeed, as the National Writers Union tells us on their website. They've been fighting against Time Warner and many, many other big media companies for years. They're wrong, all rights contracts, or buyouts as they're sometimes called, for various reasons. My German colleague Nordemann probably overstates it a bit when he tells us that the buyouts are a remnant of the bad old days of American slavery. But he has a point. He's actually one of the main motivators of the recent revision of the German Act. All rights contracts are clearly unfair towards authors who usually do not have the negotiating power to object and rarely get compensation for all those rights they give away. But they're also bad for the public domain for at least two reasons. Rights end up in the hands of big media companies will jealously guard their exclusivity and certainly not contemplate using open content licensing. In fact, the whole Creative Commons model would collapse if all authors were subjected to all rights contracts. Indeed, prior grants are considered one of the major obstacles to the working, the effectiveness of Creative Commons. And secondly, and this is the more economic argument, which I also like, rights will remain unused because no media company on earth that I know exploits works in all media now known or ever to be developed across the entire universe. They don't do that. They couldn't. Rights remain unused. That's another restriction of the public domain. Interestingly, and to underscore my main point, Creative Commons has recently taken up the fight against all rights contracts, particularly in the scientific domain, in the field of scientific publishing. This is where Science Commons 
has become Activist spin-off of Creative Commons, a project once again involving several of my hosts here at Duke, Professor Boyle again, but also Professor Artie Rye, they are both on the advisory board. A movement inspired by a lot of history that I cannot discuss, including the Berlin Declaration on Open Access to Knowledge, which requires scientists not to agree with all rights contracts. Interestingly, this declaration was embraced by the main funder of research in Europe, the Max Planck Society in Germany. To sum it up, and you're getting the point, there are some common denominators here between Creative Commons and author's rights. In both models, the author is the master of the universe. In the author's rights system, media are just users, certainly not the right holders, they always call themselves here in the United States. And in the Creative Commons model, in its purest form, no intermediaries are actually required at all. Authors not only take the law in their own hands, but they are the disseminators of their own works as well, mainly over the internet. This, to the observer from old Europe, brings a sense of déjà vu. In 1772, a few years ago, a handful of prominent German authors shocked the literary society by proclaiming something they called, and you should make a note of this, the Deutsche Gelehrtenrepublik, the Republic of Learned Men, aiming at liberating the authors from the publisher's chains by offering their works directly to the readers, circumventing those bad publishers. Not surprisingly, the plan failed because they couldn't replicate the distribution chain that was already in place. But politically, it was a great success. The Republic of Letters um, was eventually re rewarded by the in introduction of authors' rights, for which these authors had been begging for many times. So perhaps the colossal success of Creative Commons can have a similar effect here in the United States, where media companies are king and the authors, although technically in the center of the copyright universe, have always been a quantité negligible, a marginal phenomenon in the law. So in my opinion, it is, but it's only mine, I think it is high time for some measure of author's rights to be integrated into the U.S. system. And now that U.S. politicians appear to earn more money off book deals than from running the country, uh, you might think time is right, even in author-unfriendly United States. Seeing some common ground in the new world creative commons and the old world author's rights, inspires, I'm nearing the end now, dreams of a future model in which both systems and ideologies could be reconciled. Let's call it author's copyright, just to give it a working title. What might that look like? Moral rights for life, including inalienable rights of attribution and integrity, to no formality, so that's the natural justice part. And then a set of economic rights that also vest in the author, but only for a very limited term, rights of reproduction and communication to the public or whatever you want to call them, subject to formalities and subject to restrictions on transferability. That could be a nice system. Of course, it wouldn't comply with the Berne Convention, but you don't care. Back to the beginning. The public domain starts here with the author, with you and me and everyone who creates. Keeping the copyrights where they originate with us authors is the best way to safeguard a vibrant public domain. If we don't own the rights, how can we ever 
give them away to the world. Creative Commons and Authors writes, bien étonné de se trouver ensemble. Pardon my Dutch. Thank you. Question. Thank you very much for it. Um, characteristically provocative, interesting, funny talk. Um, so two real types of Creative Commons users. I'd like you to tell me how your scheme speaks to them. The first one is um, Mr. Part-Time. Mr. Part-Time writes and produces music, puts it up under Creative Commons licenses for non-commercial use with attribution, no derivatives. Um, but of course, anyone can at any time contact Mr. Part-Time and say, hey, I'd like to actually license this for commercial purposes, and what's more, I don't want to give you attribution, and what's more, I want to cut it up. I want to put it in my commercials for Saturn uh, cars. I don't want to say who it is, and I want to rewrite it, actually. I think it needs a string section in there, and I'm going to cut <laughs> it up. But the point is, but I'll pay you a lot of money. Creative Commons works for a lot of Mr. Part-Times, and they like that, and they like the fact that their permission is for the specified uses, but that then they can write contracts currently under American law, which waive all the rights you want them not to be able to waive. Then Ms. Mashup, Ms. Mashup is a, an eager sampler hip hop collage artist who thinks that your vision of the author is just so last century, who thinks that creation is all about the fragmentary sonic collage she wants and says, <laughs> The last right I want is the sexist right of paternity or the right of integrity. I think creativity is all about smashing things together. You're going to make it harder for people to make using the remix or recombo license the very uses I want to enable and that are core to my artistic being. Ms. Mashup, Mr. Part-Time, say to you, Bert, why are you doing this to us? What <laughs> well, the easy answer, of course, is the having rights doesn't mean you need to enforce them. This is actually one of the main messages of Creative Commons, by the way. I think that's a good one. We are, we are we're being indoctrinated into exercising rights that we have um, unnecessarily. Of course, Miss Mashup, uh, even with all the moral rights you might enjoy in, for instance, Germany, uh, is totally free just to let her works being mashed up into, into pulp if she wants that, and she just lets it go. Nobody will force her. There's not a public authority representing moral rights of authors. By the way, in France there is, but yeah, yeah. she could. Freed of that danger, just as the commercial company can't be freed of that danger. Uh, of course, yeah. they don't need to sue, but you might want yeah. to sleep in your bed knowing that they're not going to change their mind yeah, and sue you. Why, the, the essential question, of course, is, about waivability, and to what extent is that possible? And this is that. Do you have a few more hours? <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> th this, <laughs> this is a, a big issue in, uh, in moral rights uh, uh, countries, have, has been for years. You cannot, we all agree on one thing, you cannot alienate them. You cannot transfer your rights to someone else. Well, that's not really necessary. The more interesting question is, can you waive them? Can I agree with you? You may mash up my works, and I will n never bother you. In the US, that's possibly OK, except that I'm a foreigner and I can invoke the Bern Convention. But apart from that, um, yeah, that's no problem in, in Europe. In, in, in the US, in Europe, it might be a problem, depending on whether you call that a wave. You could also make it into a broad right to make derivative works. And that, there's nothing wrong with that. And there's a, there's a fine line here, of course, which, uh, which I'm not going to uh, uh, lose on. There is something, yes, there is something from, a, from an economics perspective, something unsatisfactory about the idea of moral rights. And there are even law and economics uh, scholars who say moral rights are uh, authors, uh, are, is, is, shooting, or is authors shooting themselves in the foot because they are depreciating the value of their own rights. They cannot license a, a, a rip, mix, and burn uh, uh, variant of their uh, 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 use type. Um, I, don't, uh, um, I don't believe that. 
or let me let me rephrase that. It's probably true that the, the, the value of the right is depreciated, but I think having moral rights is worth it. <coughs> it's a political choice. It is important that we have this baseline right that we can throw at publishers that do not structurally fairly treat us. Perhaps in a totally well-working market it would be different, but this is not the case. Well, uh, I like your pointing out the contradictions and the paradoxes of the two and the way they come together, and I think it's uh, essentially right. Uh, there's one common underlying problem that uh, doesn't go away under Creative Commons license uh, very much, or under either of the regimes, and that is if you, if you start out with this uh, very broad derivative work right, which is phrased in such a way that practically you can't work around it as you can work around the patent right. And then you expand the subject matters to these borderline things <coughs> that uh, flow into and over the industrial property line. You create enormous uh, barriers to follow on innovation. And uh, uh, in my view, you, you use author's rights to uh, circumvent the, the, the patent system and, and the, the economic logic of the negative functions of the patent system. Any thoughts on what we could do to, to uh, <coughs> to limit these very high social costs of, uh, of, of using or abusing copyright law as well. You know, the, the, the question is actually about using this powerful instrument of author's right to protect objects on the fringes of uh, <coughs> traditional works of literature, science, and art. Software is the big example, of course, or works of architecture or machine parts or industrial uh, design. Um, the, uh, the easy answer is, uh, but I'm not saying that we in Europe all have already invented this, but the easy answer would be to throw these marginal creations outside of, of this is of course the answer you want to hear, to throw them out of copyright altogether. <coughs> you, can, you can use a perfect author's rights argument to do it. This is not true creation. This is, these are functional works deserving a regime of their own. Let's call them the Reichmann hybrid regime that <laughs> Professor Reichmann has written <coughs> a lot about. And you, you, I'm sure you all know these, these very interesting articles. So I, would, I wouldn't mind throwing them out. Because that would, and, and, and meaning that would, of course, mean a, a more limited scope to these objects in a sui generis type of regime, possibly even a misappropriation kind of regime. But that takes us outside the, the, this discussion, I guess. Yeah. You have to change both the Berne Convention and the TRIPS uh, agreement. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't be discussing uh, the Reichmann theory in this, in this class. It, it, it's interesting, but I think it's slightly beside the, uh, the point here. No, but if you say you're going to cut back in your ideal <coughs> futuristic merged author's copyright, you're going to cut back on uh, uh, duration. Well, then you really have the authority to do that. So while you're at it, <laughs> why not? Just assuming you have that okay. kind of power, why not limit? Uh, yeah, we, not we, limit we can do a total restructuring. Yes, good idea. <laughs> <laughs> while we're at it in the classroom. Yeah. Any students who want to ask? <laughs> we're all students. Up there. I was a little uh, concerned about your answer for derivative works. How do you deal with something like, say, a news reporter I mean, um, who go, goes down the state Florida and writes a story about Hurricane Wilma? If you have broad, a broad um, uh, definition of derivative works, I think clearly you'd say a news story is something that could be copyrightable. So in that case, it might be difficult to have more than one source of news. How do you deal with that? Because earlier you were saying you could potentially put some fields like computer software outside of copyright law, but I don't think you would want to do that with a written work. I think uh, news well, news reports in in their in their basic uh, rudimentary form would fall out of uh, a, a traditional conception of authors' rights in the first place because they are not considered to be creation. Uh, the standards diverge a little bit in Europe, but the standards are generally somewhat higher 
than in, even in the United States after Feist. You, you have this modicum of creativity. I think in some European countries it's more than a modicum. And in, possibly in Germany it's even a really high standard. But So the news might just fall outside of copyright in the first place, so there wouldn't be a derivative work right anyway. On the other hand, derivative work, uh, the, uh, the, the, the exclusive right to make der derivative work is not unique to authors' rights. It's in your system as well. It's every, this, is, this, is not, this doesn't distinguish the two systems. So you have the same problem here. Derivative works uh, fairly similar to what you have uh, in the U.S. Uh, is that as the version you have in Europe fairly similar, or is it a more? No, the definitions are totally different. Uh, I mean, it's well, a broader the, standard, or the standards are reasonably comparable, although it's very, very difficult to generalize because there are so many countries in Europe that all have their own little doctrines. But uh, possibly economics plays a somewhat substitution plays a somewhat larger role in the United States. Whereas in, in, in Europe, the test would be, uh, look at the derivative work. Does it reflect elements from the original work that together constitute a work of authorship? So can you, can you it's, a, it's a bit of a puzzle. It, can, can we see a work of authorship taken from the original work? If the answer is yes, then there is infringement. So, not possibly not exactly the same analysis as you have in the US. Yeah, uh, academic libraries in the United States are often faced with buying back the scholarly output of their own faculty. And when you were explaining the way things were in, say, Germany, it sounds like companies like Elsevier are willing to give quite a bit for a German scholar, whereas here they're going to say, give us everything or we're not publishing you. Yeah. Do you see any resolution to that? Well, I think uh, your question uh, is, is a very good one. How does, does this difference in, 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 in regimes, does this offer protection against publishers, against media companies that exist in Europe, and that I think is very useful, does that actually, is that actually mirrored in contractual practice? I think that's basically your question. And the answer is yes. Contracts, not all, but contracts generally are fairer in Europe with the same counterpart, with the same publishers. Um, these publishers have learned perhaps to behave, but they're also forced to behave simply because there is this, this legal regime telling them that even if they want all the rights, they can't get them. So they'll have to comply with these norms. They're not all doing it. Many of them still believe that they can just write anything they want in, in, in a document. But there is, yes, there is some better behavior there in, in, in Germany, in France. The contracts I get offered, I sometimes publish in foreign journals. The pub, the, the, and, and the kind of contracts I get thrown at me in Europe are generally nicer than the American ones. And some of the American ones are despicable. I, I could give you a few anecdotes here. Mm -hmm. um, Fortunately, and I think that's a really good thing about the, the Science Commons initiative, there are now, there's a, a reversal, uh, uh, there's a, a, a new trend of, more, of much more author-friendly uh, published, science publishing contracts. Uh, uh, but there are still many, many publishers out there, out here, who are not so nice. Um, going back to Miss, Mish, Miss Mishmash, doesn't, um, the right of the author um, set up kind of discourage her form of creativity in general, not from her looking downwards, but looking from upwards down to her, where maybe she'll go out and say, well, you know, I really want to use your work in a hip hop context. And the person goes, well, I don't really like hip hop. I don't, you know, maybe if you're doing country, I'd let you use my work, but I'm not going to let you sample it for hip hop stuff. Doesn't that maybe kind of, you know, create too much of a. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I think that's a. a, a a bit of a question that Professor Boyle also asked. And I think the answer is probably yes. It probably does stifle some reuse. Uh, is that upstream or downstream? Uh, but uh, yeah, and, and in fact, this is one of the big points of discussion in when, you, when you're talking to Creative Commons people in Europe. They're all 
struggling a bit with the moral rights. The, the, um, to what extent is there's one of those one of those licenses? It's not the most popular one uh, available on the Creative Commons site. Allows you to mix, uh, rip, mix and burn, as uh, as Lawrence Lessig likes to put it, to mash. And there is there's question. There are many questions in Europe whether that is actually valid under European law. So yeah, the answer is probably it, it stifles the remixing a bit, and I would say that's worth it. To be honest, I don't want people to mess with. Them. I'm not one. I'm not miss. What was? <laughs> Mismash. Mismash up. I don't. I don't think there's. I don't. I. To be honest, I don't think there's a there's a very big public domain issue in the first place. There are not so many authors who want that at all. Maybe you might differ. I know Larry Lessig uh, has courageously agreed to have his, uh, his first of his trilogy being mashed up and republished, but we're, all, we're not all like that. I wouldn't want people to mess up my books. Would you? I actually think that it's art specific. I think there's a much stronger case for a copyright regime reflecting the range of creativity within music, which I think goes, we could think of, you know, sort of high symphony and so forth, although of course they did a lot of mashing up in their time, which would be prohibited if had your regime existed, all the way through jazz, which certainly does it, and, um, uh, and certainly to today, um, both the sort of audio visual mashups you see on the net. I think that what's happening is that we're making, you're making, an aesthetic judgment about which kinds of creativity are more valuable and more core. That, I think that's fine. You're willing to make that and acknowledge it. I think the European system makes that judgment. I think what makes it harder to figure out is there's really two themes in what you're saying. One is the natural rights theme. These are your rights. They were your rights before the state ever existed. But the other is basically we need to be paternalist to protect you from the <coughs> media and though we need to be paternalist to protect you from big media companies is at its weakest in speaking to Ms. Masha. Um, because <coughs> the kind of work that she and her cohorts <coughs> are doing is on the internet, using Creative Commons licenses because they want to cut out the intermediaries and they say to you, hey, don't be paternalistic, you know, in enforcing paternity and integrity on us because that's actually what we don't want. So I think the question is, is she going to die for the Hugenholzian revolution, so to speak? And I think, uh, is her art form going to, going to take a hit? And I think the question, the answer might be, I, as you said, I think she's in a minority. I think it's a tougher question maybe than you're, you're saying. Well, we're forgetting a dimension, of course, here. Uh, even in the, uh, in the author's rights system, in the hardcore author's rights system, like France, for instance, there is an escape valve that, that Ms. Master might really uh, like to uh, have, have a closer look at. The, the right of quotation, which in most countries uh, allows broad uses, unauthorized uses, reuses within the framework of creation. This is a, a, a copyright exception. This has nothing to do with contract. This has nothing to do with moral rights. Well, it has something to do with moral rights. There, there is a, a right of attribution sometimes involved, but it gives relatively broad user freedom to authors. Those are important. The authors are not only on the right holder side, but they're also users, as we all know. Creative Commons is the, the perfect example. So there's some there's some leeway there. Interestingly, in the Berne Convention, this 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 19th century uh, uh, reflection of, of authors' rights norms uh, has a mandatory exception for quotation. This is the only one that you have to have in your national law. So maybe it's not as bad as we all think from this match. Mash up, sorry, mashing this all up a bit. Um, yes. um, under an author's rights system, is it possible for an author to dedicate a work to the public domain to where all rights in it? That's another big question. I think the general belief is that it is not. I'm not even sure it's possible under US law. But <laughs> no, would be nice uh, for feeding economic rights. That is, I would have more problems with, uh, as I already 
explained waiving all moral rights as well. But I think the answer is probably not, but it might depend a bit on the country. I'm curious whether um, the, the right, um, the moral rights of the authors could also be derived not only from the longer history of authorship in, in Europe and of the rights connected with that, but also of consumer protection. Because the way you put it, that um, authors should also be, be guarded um, from um, big, bad media companies who have the bigger negotiating power. Um, that also seems to be something that's, um, that hints at consumer protection, which is stronger in Europe and has a, um, well, maybe not such a long tradition, but it has, um, in, in the current um, history, yeah. it has a tradition. In yeah, that's, that's a very good point. In fact, I wouldn't give the moral rights example. I would give the example of the copyright contract rules that I, that I, that I gave you. They reflect something that is more that is a, a regime that is much more sits much more comfortable in, in, in civil law tradition than in than in common law tradition. Restrictions to freedom of contract. Freedom of contract is less sacred in the, the civil law system. It is not one hundred percent sacred here either. I mean, you have labor law, you even have consumer law, but we have more. The the social justice has permeated the system, the civil law system, much more uh, traditionally in, in, in Europe than over here. So we have all sorts of restrictions on, on freedom of contract in the, in the realm of consumers, labor law, tenant law, but lots of other special regimes. And in most countries in Europe, copyright contract law is one. The structurally weaker party is protected in, in a contractual rule. So it fits very well in that tradition of consumer law that you mentioned. With that, we should close and thank Professor Hoover.